Now we turn to the hardest philosopher we're going to read in this course. Today we turn to Immanuel Kant, who offers a different account of why we have a categorical duty to respect the dignity of persons and not to use people as means merely, even for good ends. Kant excelled at the University of Königsberg at the age of 16. At the age of 31, he got his first job as an unsalaried lecturer paid on commission based on the number of students who showed up at his lectures. This is a sensible system that Harvard would do well to consider. <laughs> Luckily for Kant, he was a popular lecturer and also an industrious one, and so he eked out a meager living. It wasn't until he was 57 that he published his first major work. But it was worth the wait. The book was The Critique of Pure Reason, perhaps the most important work in all of modern philosophy. And a few years later, Kant wrote The Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, which we read in this course. I want to acknowledge, even before we start, that Kant is a difficult thinker. But it's important to try to figure out what he's saying. Because what, he, what this book is about is, well, it's about what the supreme principle of morality is, number one. And it's also, it, it gives us an account one of the most powerful accounts we have of what freedom really is. So let me start today. Kant rejects utilitarianism. He thinks that the individual person, all human beings, have a certain dignity that commands our respect. The reason the individual is sacred or the bearer of rights, according to Kant, doesn't stem from the idea that we own ourselves, but instead from the idea that we are all rational beings. We're all rational beings, which simply means that we are beings who are capable of reason. We are also autonomous beings, which is to say that we are beings capable of acting and choosing freely. Now, this capacity for reason and freedom isn't the only capacity we have. We also have the capacity for pain and pleasure, for suffering and satisfaction. Kant admits the utilitarians were half right. Of course, we seek to avoid pain and we like pleasure. Kant doesn't deny this. What he does deny is Bentham's claim that pain and pleasure are our sovereign masters. He thinks that's wrong. Kant thinks that it's our rational capacity that makes us distinctive, that makes us special, that sets us apart from and above mere animal existence. It makes us something more than just physical creatures with appetites. Now, we often think of freedom as simply consisting in doing what we want, or in the absence of obstacles to getting what we want. That's one way of thinking about freedom. But this isn't Kant's idea of freedom. Kant has a more stringent, demanding notion of what it means to be free. And though it's stringent and demanding, if you think it through, it's actually pretty persuasive. 
Kant reasons as follows. When we, like animals, seek after pleasure or the satisfaction of our desires or the avoidance of pain, when we do that, we aren't really acting freely. Why not? We're really acting as the slaves of those appetites and impulses. I didn't choose this particular hunger or that particular ap appetite. And so when I act to satisfy it, I'm just acting according to natural necessity. And for Kant, freedom is the opposite of necessity. There was an advertising slogan for the soft drink Sprite a few years ago. The slogan was, obey your thirst. There, there's a Kantian insight buried in that Sprite advertising slogan. That, in a way, is Kant's point. When you go for Sprite or Pepsi, you're really, you might think that you're choosing freely Sprite versus Pepsi, but you're actually obeying something, a thirst, or maybe a desire manufactured or massaged by advertising. You're obeying a prompting that you yourself haven't chosen or created. And here, it's worth noticing Kant's specially demanding idea of freedom. What way of acting, how can my will be determined if not by the promptings of nature or my hunger or my appetite or my desires? Kant's answer, to act freely, is to act autonomously. And to act autonomously is to act according to a law that I give myself, not according to the physical laws of nature or to the laws of cause and effect, which include my desire to eat or to drink or to choose this food in a restaurant over that. Now, what is the opposite? What is the opposite of autonomy? For Kant, he invents a special term to describe the opposite of autonomy. Heteronomy is the opposite of autonomy. When I act heteronomously, I'm acting according to an inclination or a desire that I haven't chosen for myself. So freedom as autonomy is the specially stringent idea that Kant insists on. Now, why is autonomy the opposite of acting heteronomously or according to the dictates of nature? Kant's point is that nature is governed by laws Laws of cause and effect, for example. Suppose you drop a billiard ball. It falls to the ground. We wouldn't say the billiard ball is acting freely. Why not? It's acting according to the law of nature, according to the laws of cause and effect, the law of gravity. And just as he has an unusually demanding and stringent conception of freedom, freedom as autonomy, he also has a, a demanding conception of morality. To act freely is not to choose the best means to a given end. It's to choose the end itself for its own sake. And that's something that human beings can do and that billiard balls can't. And so far as we act on inclination or pursue pleasure, we act as means to the realization of ends given outside us. We are instruments rather than authors of the purposes we pursue. 
That's the heteronymous determination of the will. On the other hand, insofar as we act autonomously, according to a law we give ourselves, we do something for its own sake, as an end in itself. When we act autonomously, we cease to be instruments to purposes given outside us. We become, or we can come to think of ourselves, as ends in ourselves. This capacity to act freely, Kant tells us, is what gives human life its special dignity. Respecting human dignity means regarding persons not just as means, but also as ends in themselves. And this is why it's wrong to use people for the sake of other people's well-being or happiness. This is the real reason, Kant says, that utilitarianism goes wrong. This is the reason it's important to respect the dignity of persons and to uphold their rights. So even if there are cases, remember John Stuart Mill said, well, in the long run, if we uphold justice and respect the dignity of persons, we will maximize human happiness. What would Kant's answer be to that? What would his answer be? Even if that were true, even if the calculus worked out that way, even if you shouldn't throw the Christians to the lions because in the long run, fear will spread, the overall utility will decline. The utilitarian would be upholding justice and rights and respect for persons for the wrong reason, for a purely contingent reason, for an instrumental reason. It would still be using people, even where the calculus works out for the best in the long run, it would still be using people as means rather than respecting them as ends in themselves. So, that's Kant's idea of freedom as autonomy. And you can begin to see how it's connected to his idea of morality. But we still have to answer one more question. What gives an act its moral worth in the first place? If it can't be directed at utility or satisfying wants and desires, what gives an action its moral worth? This leads us from Kant's demanding idea of freedom to his demanding idea of morality. What does Kant say? What makes an action morally worthy consists not in the consequences or in the results that flow from it, what makes an action morally worthy has to do with the motive, with the quality of the will, with the intention for which the act is done. What matters is the motive, and the motive must be of a certain kind. So the moral worth of an action depends on the motive for which it's done, and the important thing is that the person do the right thing for the right reason. A good will isn't good because of what it affects or accomplishes, Kant writes. It's good in itself. Even if by its utmost effort the good will accomplishes nothing, it would still shine like a jewel for its own sake as something which has its full value in itself. And so for any action to be morally good, it's not enough that it should conform to the moral law. It must also be done for the sake of the moral law. The idea is that the motive confers the moral worth on an action. And the only kind of motive that can confer moral worth on an action is the motive of duty. Well, what's the opposite of doing something out of a sense of duty because it's right? Well, for Kant, the opposite would be all of those motives having to do with our inclinations. And inclinations refer to all of our desires, all of our contingently given wants, preferences, impulses, 
and the like. Only actions done for the sake of the moral law, for the sake of duty, only these actions have moral worth. Now I want to see what you think about this idea, but first let's consider a few examples. Kant begins with an example of a shopkeeper. He wants to bring out the intuition and make plausible the idea that what confers moral worth on an action is that it be done because it's right. He says, suppose there's a shopkeeper and an inexperienced customer comes in. The shopkeeper knows that he could give the customer the wrong change, could shortchange the customer and get away with it. That at least that customer wouldn't know. But the shopkeeper nonetheless says, well, if I shortchange this customer, word may get out, my reputation would be damaged, and I would lose business. So I won't shortchange this customer. The shopkeeper does nothing wrong. He gives the correct change. But does his action have moral worth? Kant says no. It doesn't have moral worth because the shopkeeper only did the right thing for the wrong reason, out of self-interest. That's a pretty straightforward case. Then he takes another case, the case of suicide. He says we have a duty to preserve ourselves. Now, for most people who love life, we have multiple reasons for not taking our own lives. So the only way we can really tell, the only way we can isolate the operative motive for someone who doesn't take his or her life is to think, to imagine someone who's miserable. And who despite having an absolutely miserable life, nonetheless recognizes the duty to preserve oneself and so does not commit suicide. That's the force of the example is to bring out the motive that matters. And the motive that matters for morality is doing the right thing for the sake of duty. Let me just give you a couple of other examples. The Better Business Bureau. What's their, their slogan? The slogan of the Better Business Bureau? Honesty is the best policy. It's also the most profitable. This is the Better Business Bureau's full page ad in the New York Times. Honesty. It's as important as any other asset because a business that deals in truth, openness, and fair value cannot help but do well. Come join us and profit from it. What would Kant say about the moral worth of the honest dealings of members of the Better Business Bureau? What would he say? That here's a perfect example that if this is the reason that these companies deal honestly with their customers, their action lacks moral worth. This is Kant's point. Or a couple of years ago at the University of Maryland, there was a problem with cheating. And so they initiated an honor system. And they created a program with local merchants that if you signed the honor pledge, a pledge not to cheat, you would get discounts of 10 to 25% at local shops. Well, what would you think of someone motivated to uphold an honor code with the hope of discounts? It's the same as Kant's shopkeeper. The point is, what matters is the quality of the will, the character of the motive, and the relevant motive to morality can only be the motive of duty, not the motive of inclination. And when I act out of duty, when I resist as my motive for acting inclinations or self-interest 
even sympathy and altruism, only then am I acting freely. Only then am I acting autonomously. Only then is my will not determined or governed by external considerations. That's the link between Kant's idea of freedom and of morality. Now I want to pause here to see if all of this is clear or if you have some questions or puzzles. They can be questions of clarification or they can be challenges if you want to challenge this idea that only the motive of duty confers moral worth on the action. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, I actually have uh, two questions of clarification. Um, the, the first is there seems to be an aspect of this that makes it sort of uh, self-defeating in that once you're conscious of um, what morality is, you can sort of alter your motive to achieve that end of, of morality. And secondly, give, me an, give me an example of what you have in mind. Uh, the shopkeeper example, if he decides that he wants to give the person the money um, to do the right thing and he, and he decides that's his motive to do so um, because he wants to be moral, then isn't that sort of defeating trying to, um, isn't that sort of defeating the purity of his action? If, it, if, if morality is determined by his motive, his motive is, his motive is then to act morally. So you're imagining a case not of the purely selfish calculating shopkeeper, but of one who says, well, he may consider shortchanging the customer, but then he says, not, well, my reputation might suffer if word gets out, but instead he says, actually, I would like to be the kind of honest person who gives the right change to customers simply because it's the right thing to do. Or simply because I want to be moral. Because I want to be moral. I want to be a good person. And so I'm going to conform all of my actions to what morality requires. It's a subtle point. It's a good question. Kant does acknowledge you're pressing Kant on an important point here. Kant does say there has to be some incentive to obey the moral law. It can't be a self-interested incentive that would defeat it by definition. So he speaks of a different kind of incentive from an inclination. He speaks of reverence for the moral law. So if that shopkeeper says, I want to develop a reverence for the moral law, and so, I'm going to act, and so I'm going to do the right thing, then I think he's there. He's there as far as Kant's concerned. Because he's formed his motive, his will, is conforming to the moral law once he sees the importance of it. So it would count. It would count. All right, and then secondly, very quickly, um, what stops morality from becoming completely objective in this point? What stops or, morality sorry, from becoming <clears throat> completely subjective? subjective? Yeah, like how can, if there's, if morally is, if morality is completely determined by your morals, then how can you apply this or how All can right, it be that's enforced? That's also a great question. What's your name? My name is Amadi. Amadi? Yeah. All right. If acting morally means acting according to a moral law out of duty, and if it's also to act freely in the sense of autonomously, it must mean that I'm acting according to a law that I give myself. That's what it means to act autonomously. Amadi is right about that. But that does raise a really interesting question. If acting autonomously means acting according to a law I give myself, that's how I escape the chain of cause and effect and the laws of nature. What's to guarantee that the law I give myself when I'm acting out of duty is the same as the law that Amadi is giving himself and that each of you gives 
yourselves? Well, here's the question. How many moral laws, from Kant's point of view, are there in this room? Are there a thousand, or is there one? He thinks there's one which in a way does go back to this question, all right, what is the moral law? What does it tell us? So what guarantees? It sounds like it, to act autonomously is to act according to one's conscience, according to a law one gives oneself. But what guarantees that we, if we all exercise our reason, we will come up with one and the same moral law? That's what Amadi wants to know. Here's Kant's answer. The reason that leads us to the law we give ourselves as autonomous beings is a reason, it's a kind of practical reason that we share as human beings. It's not idiosyncratic. The reason we need to respect the dignity of persons is that we're all rational beings. We all have the capacity for reason. And it's the exercise of that capacity for reason which exists undifferentiated in all of us that makes us worthy of dignity, all of us. And since it's the same capacity for reason, unqualified by particular autobiographies and life circumstances. It's the same universal capacity for reason that delivers the moral law. It turns out that to act autonomously is to act according to a law we give ourselves exercising our reason, but it's the reason we share with everyone as rational beings, not the particular reasons we have given our upbringings, our particular values, our particular interests. It's pure practical reason in Kant's terms which legislates a priori regardless of any particular contingent or empirical ends. Well, what moral law would that kind of reason deliver? What is its content? To answer that question, you have to read the groundwork and we'll continue with that question next time.